Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you can rely on the lawyer to check his watch before he uses the appropriate terminology to address the client. Um, I've got four things to tell you about t t uh, this morning. Let's just see if I can get rid of that. No, I can't. Yes. Um, this is partly, um, hopefully, some useful um, items of information about four different topics, and partly a little commercial for the, uh, or taster for the four topics. Um, if I may just introduce myself, uh, my name is Rob Langley, I'm a solicitor, I'm also qualified as a barrister, but I got tired of being rude to policemen, uh, especially when I realised that if my clients hadn't stolen that particular car, it's because they were busy stealing a different one in a different town at the time. So they always had a good alibi, we just couldn't use it, um, which is kind of frustrating really. Uh, so I became a commercial solicitor and eventually one day um, I was summoned by the senior partner. It was the days when they still called you by your surname, just after we'd given up horses actually, and because um, I'm incredibly well preserved. And uh, the senior partner said, oh, Langley, um, I've got a quantity surveyor in to see me. I don't know what he is uh, or what he wants, but just see him for me. There's a good fellow. Um, so I did. And he had a crisp box full of papers. It was a Tudor Chris box, and uh, it was a dispute on 44 dwellings in a local authority housing scheme, that's how long ago it was, uh, in, uh, in, on the Biker Wall in Newcastle, and I thought it was fascinating, uh, and we met with the engineers and the architects, and they drew me loads of drawings, and I love drawings, and um, um, the second case I did, so I went from being kind of inquisitive about building and com engineering matters to, I did another case the following week and I became competent and I did a third case, I became an expert. Uh, and I, <laughs> it's what you do in the law, uh, it's all self-proclamation. So I became an expert in construction and engineering matters since when I've done oil rigs, dams, reservoirs, housing estates, hotels, um, people's garages, Mrs. Quaddy's kitchen extension, uh, and all sorts of um, disputes large and small and I've drafted lots of contracts, I've drafted all the building contracts for the Metro Centre in, in Newcastle and lots of projects since. Uh, and I love my subject and I love my clients actually, especially the ones who pay. Um, they, they're the best. But I, I, I enjoy working with engineers. They're all cleverer than me and they're all patient and they explain things to me, uh, so, you know, why, why things are, um, work the way they do. <clears throat> and uh, here I am. Um, I'm specialising in engineering work and um, so I have been working for the ISE for about two years, three years, doing, um, basically uh, we run a course called um, Contract Law for Engineers and we, I have lots of um, worked examples and scenarios and I divide you up into warring groups and I, make, I send you out and make you argue with each other uh, and I don't tell you what the answer is and make you work it out and then we I kind of explain to you what the concepts are and we, we, deal, we deal with all this sort of complicated nonsense like promissory estoppel and uh, a consent by acquiescence and all sorts of stuff like that. We, we unpack it. It's just jargon. And as, we, as you know, you use jargon because it's much simpler to say a wrench than to say uh, an object which will move an inanimate and awkward nut by a certain amount by the application of appropriate forces. Just say it's a wrench or it's a spanner or whatever. The, the terms that we use in the law are the same. They're just labels. And, and I explain the labels. I tell you when you can use the words without prejudice, without making a fool of yourself. Uh, or without my making a fool of myself. So I just explain things in simple terms. Uh, I try and make it applicable by, I tell you, a lot of the case stories. It's easy to remember the story about the, uh, the wind farm in the Solway Firth, which is um, Aeon versus M.T. Hogard, um, a recent Supreme Court decision. It's easier to remember about the wind farm than it is to remember the specific points about strict liability and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, warranties of, of performance. It's easier to do it that way. So I've had lots of experience teaching professional colleagues, architects, engineers, other solicitors, surveyors, insurance brokers and underwriters. Uh, and uh, I've applied that to working with the institution's members and enjoyed myself in the process. Um, the three new courses that we've worked up together uh, with Peter Washer and Christy MacDonald and myself uh, are essentially, we hope, things that will be interesting to you. So let's just talk about them because I've only got about 
80 minutes left and Rob turns me into a pumpkin and I get carried off for lunch. Um, so first of all, if, you, if I just press the right button, a couple of half-day courses. First of all, a course on dealing with domestic clients, which takes a lot of components of other things and applies them in the context of, uh, of um, consumer protection and the very limited grasp of what's going on, with very often, which very often domestic clients have. Uh, a half a day on the Construction Act, uh, your rights and your duties, and there are some really important rights and duties that you have as suppliers of construction services. Uh, all the contracts that you work for, um, by and large, are covered by the definition of a contract for construction operations on the UK mainland. Um, then a couple of full day courses, um, from 10 till half past five, uh, client care and dealing with complaints and claims, so that's going to cover insurance, it's going to cover uh, this, some, a little bit of the psychology and the common sense of dealing with clients. An important component about strict liability, professional skill and care, when you've actually done a good job as opposed to when you haven't. Quite an important bit about um, the, the code of conduct. Um, and then we'll uh, a full day, and I, I've done this repeatedly as an in-house course for engineers and architects and airports and electricity generating authorities and all sorts, on client appointments and terms of engagement, going through them in detail. Um, so just to talk about these in a little more detail. So the domestic sector is, is householders, it's small business people, um, and they are different to commercial clients um, because they don't have the same sophistication or knowledge as commercial clients. Um, they have special protections. We can't just exclude liability or limit liability in, in contracts with commercial clients because they're covered by the consumer um, protection legislation and by the unfair terms in consumer contracts uh, regulatory legislation. Um, the, the forum for, um, for any or the means for any uh, resolution of disputes is very often going to be the small claims court, which is very, very rough and ready. Uh, it's also very inexpensive and quite fast, but uh, there are upsides and downsides too. There are problems with assets. If, uh, Mr. Mr. if Mr. and Mrs. Smith commissioned you for £5,000 worth of work, the chances are they've saved up that £5,000 or they've borrowed it. And if you don't get paid and you sue them and you get judgment, the court will order them to repay it £50 a month. Well, that's like 100 months, isn't it? So you've got problems with how do I get paid? I, can I get paid up front? Can I withhold my work? And that's a legal question. Can I validly withhold my work uh, until I've been paid? And we'll look at that and we'll, we'll, we'll work through it. And we'll look at when you can and when you can't. Um, clarity. Every single contract in the, in the whole uh, country depends upon clarity of in its wording and comprehension in its wording. But it's very hard to do. You spend most of your lives dealing on a common sense basis with common sense people. People like me are here for the hundredth, the one in a hundredth case or the one in a thousandth case where common sense isn't enough. That's what the law's for. It's when common sense isn't enough and when goodwill isn't enough and when you meet that nightmare client from hell or possibly Hartlepool, who um, <laughs> quite often Hartlepool, uh, you know what they do to monkeys in Hartlepool, don't you? You don't know what they do. Does anybody know what they do to the monkeys in Hartlepool? Hang them. Yes, hang them, that's exactly right, yes. There's not many monkeys in Hartlepool High Street. Um, you didn't want to know that, did you? No. So clarity about what you're going to do, and most importantly, what you're not going to do for the money. Because your client, your domestic client, genuinely doesn't know. And they can come up with some very strange ideas. Um, talking to people, dealing with variations, should you do extra work? Well, you want to because you and I are in a service industry, or in service industries, plural. We, our instinct is to look after clients. We're professional people. We want to do our best. You can find yourself, unfortunately, very exposed doing lots and lots of extra work. And if you're dealing with a commercial client, then he or she is very well aware that an extra piece of work equals an extra obligation to pay. Um, a, con a domestic client, it probably never occurs to them that that nice Mr. Langley, the engineer up the road, um, has done all this extra work. And now, goodness, I've already paid him a thousand pounds. Why does he want two? Why does he want three? You never told me you were going to charge me more for this extra work. To you, it's common sense to get paid. To them, why would it be? They've never had an engineer working for them before, or, um, or they don't remember. 
Um, and so they, they, they don't know what to expect, and very often their expectation is not the same as ours, as professional people. You do not have to do variations as a matter of common law. So if you decide to do one, you should price it and, uh, and, and agree the price in advance. And agreeing the price uh, in, uh, in verbally is not good enough. The court will always assume that the person with the collar and tie, the person with the business attire, is, uh, is the one that should be keeping their paperwork right. Not Joe Soap, your client, or Mrs. Soap. Um, so we always have to write things down, we have to keep notes, and there are consequences which we'll look at if we don't. You may decide to supervise a contractor, you may be watching him um, making a mess even if you're not supervising him. Do you have to give a warning? Who do you have to give that warning to and when don't you have to do so? Communication, complaints, managing expectations. We will be dealing with all those things in that half-day course. The Construction Act is an interesting act of Parliament. Supposing I'm, I'm working for you, suppose I'm doing something, I'm, 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 tiling, your, I'm tiling your house, and we agree that um, you'll pay me by three instalments, one when I start, one when I buy the tiles, and three when I've finished. Supposing I start work and you don't pay me, do I have, can, I, can I just say, well, you haven't paid me, so I'm going to stop work. Is it legitimate to stop work because someone hasn't paid you? Who thinks it isn't legitimate to stop work because you haven't been paid? One. <coughs> That's not a bit, no, 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 you can't, you can't in quite, no, no, I get that. It's V asks of questions. Um, so is it legitimate? to uh, stop work if you haven't been paid. Who thinks it is? Nearly everybody, when you're all wrong. You're all wrong, and I, I'm not trying to score a point. It's common sense that if you're not being paid, you could stop work. That's common sense, isn't it? It's not the law. The law does not allow you to break your contract by ceasing to perform. Ceasing to perform is a breach of contract, because just because I haven't performed my contract, my side of the contract, doesn't mean that you can stop performing yours. So, um, and uh, however, under the um, Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act of 1996, you do, where you are carrying out a contract for construction operations, have the right to give a notice where a debt is due and then cease to perform. You see, there's a difference, ladies and gentlemen, between repudiating your contract. You haven't paid me our first instalment. That's a breach of contract. Our con I accept your breach. Our contract is now at an end. So I'm not going to do the job. Hmm. and you're not going to get the service. However, you often don't want to do that, do you? You don't want to stop performing because you've got a nice big profit built into this work. You've got nothing else to do this week. You want to do the job. You just want to get paid. So you, rather than cancel the contract, you want to suspend. You can't suspend unless the law gives you a right to do so. And the Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act does give you that right. It's a special regime for, for, uh, for people involved in construction and engineering services, and we'll look at how that works and why. We'll look at a lot of other things uh, un under the um, construction act. I must remember to press the button. What the act does, why it matters, and don't think, oh, I can just read all this, it's dead simple, because A, it's drafted in the most incredibly baffling prose, and B, just when you're getting the hang of it, in 1998, Parliament passed the Local, Devel the Local Democracy and Economic Development Act, or LDEDA, uh, L -D -E -D -A, of 1998, uh, amending the Act extensively. Since when, um, the government's legislation website has not been updated for the last 20 years, so uh, reading the two Acts together is extremely difficult. You will get, as a luxury gift, uh, a, as part of this course if you come to it, an actual amended copy of the Act to cut out and keep. Um, when does the Act apply? It doesn't apply to power stations. Um, uh, there's a lot about cash flow protection from your point of view. Um, there's a, let, let me ask you another question, <laughs> and, um, and you'd be getting used to me by now. Um, if, I'm, if I'm a consultant engineer, and I'm doing a job, and I hire you as my sub-consultant to do a particular aspect, uh, and uh, I haven't been paid, can I refuse to pay you? I can't refuse to. Who, says, who thinks I can refuse to pay you? Nobody. Who thinks I can't bother? Yes, you are all quite right. Uh, I can't just refuse to pay you. That's a result of the Act. 
if, if this was a normal contract um, um, whereby, I don't know, um, I, I'm a, a solicitor and I've hired another solicitor as a consultant to help me out, I could say to him, I'm sorry old chap, my, I've said in my contract um, I don't have to pay you if I haven't been paid, so I'm not going to. That's valid. But in construction, in the construction world, you are protected by, by that provision. You've got cheap, fast enforcement in the form of adjudication. Adjudication is a fantastic tool. 28 days, you can ambush people on Christmas Eve. It's great fun. Um, and ruin their weekends, uh, all this sort of thing. Adjudication is a very powerful means of enforcing uh, a right to be paid. However, it is a poison chalice. And we'll look at that. We'll look at how it works, how it doesn't work. We'll have lots of case studies and scenarios. So that would be a useful thing for you to send your commercial manager or yourself if you're the sole proprietor and you're, you're, you are your own commercial manager, then come along to that. Half a day from two till six. Client appointments in terms of engagement. This is based upon a, a very popular course I've been presenting um, directly for um, some of the bigger engineering consultancies. Um, whereby we spend a half a day and we look through all the jargon of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, con of contracts for services, i.e. your appointment forms. Um, and uh, we look at um, 12 key issues um, for in, in that area. And I suddenly thought, what happens if people ask me what the 12 key issues are? Well, um, exclusion of liability, control of risk, um, Identifying who the parties are, a surprisingly difficult process. Uh, waiver, what does that mean? What are conditions precedent? Um, how, how do you know you've received a notice? Please don't tell me it's when it's got the word notice written on it because you'd be wrong. The High Court says I do not need to word, use the word notice or the word or the verb notify anywhere in a notice document. I can hide a notice to you inside a long letter and still bind you by it. Um, assignment of burden. You get an inquiry in from a potential client. You do a credit check on them. They look fine. Um, perhaps if it's a domestic client, you look to see if the house has got a mortgage on it. You think, no, it's not mortgage. That's great. That's a marvellous. Um, and then the, it's a small business, and they're a bit commercially aware, and they send you their terms of business on which they procure your services. They probably bought it off uh, the internet. Um, and you sign up to that because you want the job, and it's a good price. Um, and it says that um, the, the employer, your client, can assign the contract. So you've checked them out very carefully, and then the client says uh, he's going to assign the contract. Um, you um, send a bill to, in to him, and he writes back to you and says, uh, oh, thanks, but I've assigned this contract to uh, Dodgy Dealings Limited. Uh, just ask them to pay you. Can he do that? Or can you insist upon him paying you? Couple of people skeptical. Who thinks that he can do that? Uh, four, um, no, eight or nine. Um, large group in the middle who are abs abstaining on that and Heathrow. Um, obviously, all, all Scottish nationalists. Um, I hope not. Um, well, the answer is that um, uh, it is perfectly legal for someone who has an assignment clause in their contract with you to refuse to pay you on the basis that they've assigned their, their debts to somebody else. However, they can still retain their rights over you, so they can inf insist on you performing, even though Dodgy Dealings is now the paying customer. And you could end up doing the entire job and not being paid for it, unless you exercise the rights of suspension and breach, which we will also go into as part of this. Um, other issues, um, the difference between a deed and an ordinary written contract. Um, the word indemnity. Anybody familiar with the word indemnity? You'll get that in contracts a lot. Uh, it, it means a lot of bad things, which we'll go into, and you'll learn the reasons why you shouldn't ever sign an indemnity unless it's a reference to a professional indemnity insurance policy. Um, part of this course will be an invitation to those attending to send me in anonymously um, anonymized um, docu um, contracts they've signed up themselves or are going to sign up and we'll do a critique uh, in, in the session of uh, the obvious clauses and dangers. They're usually not that obvious. So that will be a really useful, that will be quite a hard working day um, and you get pushed through that but you should enjoy it. And then fourthly, 
uh, client care. You, looking at, for example, what is your, what is your standard of care? Um, how is it defined? Um, uh, how, how, what is the difference between that and strict liability? What does your ins professional indemnity insurance indemnify you professionally against? Um, when is it triggered? What, what is the importance of notification to insurers? How important is it to get a correct statement of your risks and of your business in your proposal form? What is the new insurance act of 2015? What has that done to your relationship with your insurers? Um, how do you manage complaints with clients? Um, I had a, just in my own practice uh, a while ago, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, one of my assistants, uh, wrote to a lady who was our client, and unfortunately, and it was the letter, it was a letter all about, you know, you may be liable for this, but you're not liable for that, and we recommend you do this, we don't recommend you do that, and it'll all cost so and so. Unfortunately, we sent the letter to number 13 and not number 30. And uh, the lady at number 13 had the same surname as the lady at number 30 and opened this letter and read it. And then went round to number 30 and said, oh, I'm awfully sorry, I've, I've read your letter and uh, it's a big problem you've got, isn't it? And I'm sorry about that. Anyway, here it is. Um, my client was not very pleased. And she was so angry, she wrote this long letter about what a bunch of idiots we were and so on and so forth uh, and said, what's wrong, I'm not paying a bill. It was quite a large bill. We did a lot of work. We got a good result. Um, so it was a bill for about four or five thousand pounds, but she wasn't going to pay it. So I, I, I actually I, I wrote to her because I tried phoning and the phone wasn't answered. So I wrote and I said, I understand what you're saying. I'm really sorry to read all this. Um, obviously, we've made a mistake. Um, but it's not a five thousand pound. No, I didn't say that. I said, obviously, we. The, the, I didn't say we made a mistake. I said, obviously. This is very serious. Please, can we talk about this? Would you like to come in for a cup of tea? Could I offer you um, four o'clock next Tuesday sort of thing? And here she came in with her daughter, armed for battle. She was going to have a, a real go at me. And so I let her have a go at me. And then I said, you're absolutely right. And this shouldn't have happened. But do you think this is a £5,000 mistake? And she said, well, not really. I said, well... I've done all this work for you. I don't think I think it's fair that you should be compensated. But I don't think it's fair because you've been very upset and very embarrassed and humiliated by your neighbours. But I don't think it's fair that I shouldn't I shouldn't get paid at all. Do you think that's fair? She said, "Well, maybe it isn't." I said, "Well, how about if we call it four thousand pounds instead of five? Would you think that was fair?" Because that's all I'm going to do. And she said, "That would be great." So we shook hands, finished a cup of tea, and she went away. And I'd lost some money on the, on the process, but I'd lost a lot less than if I had to defend this in court and win uh, and make the woman go away a year and a half later. So I was a lot better off. That's just a little, sort of anecdote of dealing with um, complaining clients. We will talk about how to deal with, the, with without prejudice correspondence. We'll talk about the importance of note-taking. I will explain to you what electronic disclosure is. You've always wanted to know. Um, we'll talk about, um, about uh, coverage issues and dealing with your underwriters and keeping them happy. And we'll do a little bit about how dispute resolution works, adjudication, mediation, litigation, and so on and so forth. And we'll also unpack a lot of jargon. Um, one of the things that we will do, um, which will be really, really interesting, in the first section of this talk will be to take a, a, a seven or eight actual examples of complaints against engineers that the institutions handled. Um, and we'll just take the, the, the fact scenarios and one by one we'll work through them and then we'll look and, and you'll come up with the answers you think are the right answers and what should the engineer have done and what did they do wrong. And then we'll look at what the institution did when it actually answered the client's problem and, and what remedies it ordered and so on and so forth. And it's not always obvious what the outcome of these things are. So an interesting day, a day when as a fellow professional we'll be working together through issues of prof professional and ethical uh, compliance with uh, legal obligation and with the management of actual litigation or other complaints. So that's my, that's my commercial um, uh, introduction to you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you found it, I hope I've wet your, your appetite a little bit. The way that, that I like to, to deal with these courses is to engage you, to give you a lot of information, but also to do practical scenarios, to work through examples, to talk about them. People usually enjoy the debate and the little bit of conflict with the because we divide you into two groups. Some stratagems. Um, oh, that's the wrong slide. Yeah. Um, 
and some slides, lots of slides. You'll find the slides are actually quite useful notes afterwards and some resource materials, so copies of cases, copies of clauses, um, some extra extracts from, from court cases and some extracts from statutes that you can take away, and some little diagrams on how things like limitation periods work. Uh, and then we'll have um, some questions. But Rob, I think it's, I've finished now, haven't I? And it's my turn to sit down and shut up. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay.